Shalom, everyone. Welcome back to a, another episode of After Hours. Um, pleasure as ever to be with you. If you've not already checked out our latest episode on the main channel, on the uh, upper room, uh, my guest, Rebecca, uh, we got into the subject of covenants and commitment, a uh, real deep conversation. If you've not checked it out already, head over, and uh, I'm sure you'll be blessed by that one. Um, today, uh, I'm excited to get into the third part of the mini-series of The Laborers in the Vineyard. Uh, previous episodes, we've looked at uh, apologists, uh, street preachers, evangelism. And this week, I thought we'd take a look at something a bit closer to home, uh, to an area in which uh, I would imagine this audience would be more familiar with, and that would be the area of Messianic Ministries. Um, now, for, for those of those who are, for those of you who are familiar, uh, those are on the Torah path, uh, who are used to the sound of the shofar blowing, of the zit zit wearing, uh, follower of Yeshua, um, I thought it would be a great opportunity yet again to celebrate and uh, exhort those in this area of the body who do a lot of good work to build, edify, and encourage uh, those in this area of the path. Uh, call it Torah observance, Hebrew roots, uh, many different labels bandied about, but for me personally, uh, this is uh, a very um, heartwarming and um, special area. Now, the, the whole part of this mini-series was to take a look at the, the different uh, parts of the body of Christ and to celebrate and to point out the good works, the good things that, that are taking place, irrespective of theology, irrespective of doctrine, and um, just to uh, look at the, the good that's taking place. And uh, today's no exception. We'll be looking at uh, some uh, friends uh, some familiar uh, ministries who have impacted myself personally at uh, different points of my walk, uh, continue to do so as well. And uh, hopefully these will be people that you're familiar with and we have a sentimental attachment to that. But just to, just to look a- around and say, you know what, we're in good company. We've got some serious laborers doing the work of, of Yah and... Um, to say thank you and to um, admonish and and appreciate uh, those that that put themselves on the line, uh, albeit teachers, uh, albeit online ministries. And um, I think there's a degree of satisfaction in familiarity when we can come together and go, yeah, I I like this. I like these guys. I I like what they do. And, you know, much like the the wider view of, of this series is, we, we may not necessarily hold uh, the scripture to exactly the same measure in terms of what we believe and understand at this current moment, but that should never detract from finding the commonality and um, finding that uh, unification within the scriptures because I, I think we're gonna, you're scarcely going to find a ministry or a teacher that gets everything absolutely uh, spot on and perfect and even to, to your own taste. And that's something I've come to learn over the years is to, uh, you know, appreciate what I agree with, to, uh, to uh, agree to disagree with the things I may not, um, but still love them and appreciate the, the work that they do. So uh, with that being said, um, with regards to messianic ministries, uh, if you hear any background noise, it's because I'm literally fresh off uh, the back of a, a Shabbat gathering here at the Almond House. Um, so if you hear the sound of children playing, uh, people talking, you may not hear it, I don't know, but praise Yah for that. Praise Yah for fellowship, praise Yah for being able to gather uh, with those who love Jesus, who love God, and endeavour to try to do that in the ways that are instructed in the Bible. So with that being said, I've got some uh, clips lined up. I've got some ministries lined up. We're going to take a look at them today. 
again, you may find fault in somebody's teaching at some point or other, because if, you know, they have hundreds of hours of content on their YouTube channel, you're probably going to find something you disagree with or might uh, maybe slightly out of touch with how you see scripture uh, to be. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, I don't mind that. It's okay. Um, so let's take a look at our first uh, offering. That will be uh, Mr. Or should I say, uh, Dr. Michael Lake. Um, now, this individual, I first came across, I think, pretty early in, on in my walk. Um, this series, uh, in sp it's this series in specific that I, I've enjoyed. I've, I've, gen, I've probably watched it about three times over, over the years, and um, I think this is nearly ten years old now. But uh, again, it's it's great, it's great stuff. So it stands the the test of time. Now, now Mike Lake is uh, YouTube channel Biblical Life TV. Uh, he's also got a uh, podcast. I don't know if it's still going. Um, the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing, which I, if I remember rightly, he records with his wife uh, Mary. And um, yeah, understanding the kingdom. The the well, I, I'll let the uh, the introduction play out for itself, and it will give you an oversight. Now, um, we'll watch the clip, and then we'll get into some of the things that I really like about. Uh, the individual and and this series in particular so let's take it back um again i've said this often in this series there's so much uh, content uh that you can get into with these individuals so don't take these clips as the finality i, I think this that i think this series itself is 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 really really good um, and again, uh, just for the sakes of clarity uh, and and for your own discretion, th this is my preference. This isn't uh, necessarily an endorsement uh, from the Almond House itself. I would imagine that there are individuals that we will see, uh, ministries that we will see uh, coming up in this episode where we have either uh, done work with or would be endorsed by. However, just to, to premise this, this is my preference and uh, what I appreciate. So, if you don't like it, you uh, you're not onto it. Then that's fine. That's cool. But you might well be. So, tell you what, the last couple of weeks have been just kind of a whirlwind in themselves, and. Uh, just really trying to center up on what God wants and what God needs to speak to us about to prepare us for the days ahead. And here a week or so ago, I was doing an interview with a young man named Daniel Duvall uh, for the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing, and his passion is the kingdom of God. And uh, the word tells us that iron sharpens iron, and in that discussion, there's a lot in, in his book, Beyond the Kingdom of God, that we were discussing, but we just got caught just talking about the kingdom of God, and an hour and a half went like that. And never really entered into any other discussion of anything else he was writing in his book. And uh, it just kind of rebirthed something in me and began to stir something in me. And the next day I was exercising on the treadmill. And I don't know what it is about me and treadmills. Maybe I need to stay on it more because God really seems to talk to me on one. And uh, God came and visited me and he said, you want me to show you something? Well, I, I know not to say no. Last time he did that, I was on a treadmill and he deposited within 20 minutes a teaching that took me over 21 weeks to teach called Priesthood of the Believer. And so I said, sure. And in those 15, 20 minutes that was left on the treadmill, he began to show me the kingdom and started in Genesis chapter 1, and he took me all the way through the book of Revelation. And it's all about the kingdom. If you understand kingdom, and if you understand it right, a lot of the arguments are going to end. You see, part of the problem that we have in, in people uh, standing against the commandments of God or what this or that or, or all the divisions that we have is because people have been building their own kingdoms. 
Sometimes we call them denominations. There was a guy that decided he was going to be the bishop of bishops, and he made himself the pope. And he was creating for himself a kingdom and declared that he was the vicar of Christ on the earth. How many know God is not after land? He's not after territory. He's after the hearts of men. That's where the kingdom of God is established. And when you begin understanding kingdom, everything falls into place. But to really walk in kingdom, you've got to die. You've got to die to self because self always wants to create its own kingdom. It wants to create its own idols. And God is saying, no, he's calling us to, to really understand. When we understand that really the kingdom and the understanding of it is quintessential to understanding all the word of God. If you don't start it with kingdom and it's kingdom throughout, you're going to miss all the points. You're not going to connect all the dots. And so I think what God is wanting us to do, for us to be that remnant church, for us to be that remnant warrior in last days, we're going to have to understand kingdom because we're going to have to move in kingdom power, kingdom authority with kingdom purpose, or you're not going to move at all. And so God is wanting us to do this, and especially, guys, we're, we're living in a time that we can turn on the television at night and watch the news and watch Bible prophecy begin unfolding before our very eyes. You see, the truth of the matter is, with all the nations of the earth and everything that's going on, it really boils down to two kingdoms are at war right now, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. So I want to, like I always do, we're going back to Bereshit. We're going back to Genesis 1. All things start at the beginning. So just to, uh, just to kick off... Um uh, th this series, uh, the premise, as he, as he loosely stated there, is about the, the walking in the, uh, the principles of the kingdom of God uh, and how the, the, the commandments, the word, the fullness of the word and an understanding of the fullness of the word, which, again, for those in the messianic uh, area, that will be music to your ears. It's the, it's the fullness of, of the scroll and how that contributes to walking in uh, the fullness of the kingdom of God. And um, that's, uh, it's, I remember at the time watching this, it was incredibly uh, empowering, uh, inspiring, uh, motivating uh, in the sense of... Um, merging the principle of what it means to bring the kingdom uh, from heaven here on earth and how we do that individually and, and corporately. Um, the style of this is really cool in the sense that it's done in a kind of, um, I'd, I'd say a, a mini Parsha sense that he, he starts in Genesis and works his way through um, in, a, in an abbreviated way in order to tailor the uh, the sermon and the message in respect to this uh, principle of, of walking in the kingdom. Um, you know, just, I, I know it's not all about what's on, on the show, but we've got the chauffeur, we've got the menorah, so immediately you're going to be like, oh, okay, what, what's going on with this guy? And um, I, I would challenge anybody to uh, watch this and not feel like empowered by... Uh, the words that are shared and um, yeah uh, let's have a look uh, a bit further on in the uh, in the message in this particular one again there's like there's about 60 parts to this and I, I know it wasn't uh, intended for him initially to be this long but I'm sure as most teachers and pastors would um, attest once you start something it normally ends up going a a bit longer like when he said uh you know a, a 20 part series uh i remember hearing that to start with and thinking wow that's that's a long but actually uh our teacher our minister joe's just uh, finished uh i believe a, a study on the book of galatians which was uh about 15 weeks and i'm sure that could have been 30 easily anyway let's uh let's get into it why did God take the dust of the earth? And why did he form a body out of the dust of the earth? Because it gives us the right to have authority in the earth because we're made of this dimensional reality. 
And so he had to give us a body to express the dominion and different things he wanted to do. And so here he, for, he, he and the, the rabbis try to mess this up, and they're trying to farm their golems. They're trying to be like God. How many know you can't be like God? You always end up being like Dr. Frankenstein if you're not careful. God forms the dust of the earth, and he makes a man. But look what it says here. It says he breathed the breath of life into man. And that at that moment, Almighty God didn't speak man until he, he first said, I'm going to do this, but out of all creation, you're the only one that God got his hands dirty for. <laughs> How many know the cross was dirty business? He told us the end from the beginning. He got his hands dirty making us, and he's going to get it. He got his hands dirty redeeming us. At that moment that he breathed life into man, he fathered Adam. He fathered him. There's no place where he breathed the breath of life into angels. No matter how powerful Lucifer is or the two that replaced him over his throne, he didn't father them, even though they are called B'nai Elohim in the same sense that he fathered man. At that moment, Adam became a son, and Almighty God became a father, and he became a living soul. <laughs> Why did God do that? Why did God actually work with his hands when he made man instead of just speaking him into existence? Since man was created by the work of God's hands, there would be work for man's hands to always do in the name of his father. What I like about him personally as well is this, um, uh, the element of like the kind of Baptist preacher, you know, like the, the fire and brimstone, like passion, uh, but you're merging it with a love for the Torah and the feast and everything else, which, you know, w when you look at um, a lot of kind of uh, typical American Christianity, as it were, you, you see a lot of the fire, a lot of the, the good stuff, but you think, oh, gosh, if only they could just just bring it, bring bring the Torah in and it would just, like, pop off. And I, I, that's what I, I, I see in, and appreciate in Mike Lake is this. Uh, he's obviously been in... in in the faith for a long time. Uh, I'm not too sure as to when um, uh, when he, he came to the, the revealing of, of, of this stuff. But, um, yeah, I just think it's, it's, a, it's an amazing combination. And for those who are familiar, obviously you've got this kind of element of the ultra grace movement and then you've got the kind of legalist on the other side and there's a sweet spot in the middle and, the, the, the beauty of this series and he goes into more depth uh, as the series goes on and even within this episode about the principle of um, obedience to God's word and how that brings um, n not just prosperity and blessing but just the kingdom in, in all that you do whether it's in the office uh, whether it's um, you know on the factory floor or Whatever, you, whatever it is that, that, that you do, that uh, you can bless um, those around you and, and your environment in, in not some whacked out prosperity, word of faith, charismatic kind of loosey, you know, way. This, this is based on solid scriptural principles. Um, and... There's a degree of sentiment attached to to this for me personally because I could I could sit there for long periods of time and just sponge up a lot of these teachings and sit there for hours just sponging in all the information and all of the teachings and uh, when you're in that kind of first love honeymoon period you can you can do that and this was a great series for me back in the day for when I. I I was introduced to it and um, was able just to, to go through them. So um, if you're led, uh, by all means, check out uh, Mike Lake, a prolific author as well, writes a lot of books. I've never read any, any of them, so I couldn't say that I'd recommend them. 
Um, but I can certainly recommend this series, Understanding the Kingdom. Uh, head on over and check it out and uh, see what you think. I'd be surprised if it doesn't bless you. Okay, so next up we have the Assembly of Called Out Believers uh, with Pastor Isaac. Um, I've I've known on and off about these guys for, for a little while, but it's only in the last, I'd say, two years that um, I, I've really sort of uh, took in uh, took in their teachings and and got into it um we'll watch a clip or two and then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll chat about them he says i am to be regarded as holy among the people of israel i am yod hey vav hey who makes you holy who brought you out of the land of egypt to be your god i am adonai and your bridegroom your betrothed says hey i want to meet with you every week I want to meet with you and seven times a year I want to meet with you this is going to be the only time that I can come and we can build relationship before the wedding every day is common and it's for work the seventh day is holy to the Lord thy God in it you shall not do any work the fourth commandment says you or your son or your daughter your manservant your maidservant your ox your cattle even the stranger within thy gate for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them but on the seventh day he rested and he blessed it and he sanctified it. He did. If he orchestrated this from the foundation of the world and it's going to be in the renewed world, why would he ever do away with it in between? He hasn't. That's what the renewed covenant is of Jeremiah 31. He says, it's not like the covenant of old which I made with your forefathers where I gave them a written Torah. I'm going to write my Torah on their heart. It doesn't take but one generation. If you assimilate and you let go of Shabbat and you observe other religious practices, these things will be forgotten in one generation. A real short clip, but I think that um, uh, it, it already paints a picture of, uh, for me, uh, his ability to convey the bridal uh, covenantal element of what it means to be a messianic believer, um, to approach the word with spirit and truth. Uh, with an emphasis on on love, and uh, quite often Isaac's sermons are interlaced, it was Parsha's are interlaced with uh, the picture of being about being called out as a as a bride, uh, a remnant bride to be spotless and unblemished, ready for the return of Yeshua, and how obedience to to not even obedience, but the observance of the Torah, uh, the mitzvot and the commandments how they are all designed to preserve and give life and love and to prepare a bride ready for the millennial uh, kingdom and an eternal reign with, with Yeshua. Um, even in, uh, this is my, my personal opinion, there is a, there is a sweetness in uh, the way in which uh, Isaac delivers his messages, even the tone of his voice, um, and he can be saying the most uh, hard-hitting scriptural principle, and it's done in such a way that um, it's it's like as it says in the scripture, it's it's sweet to taste, but it's bitter in the stomach because it sounds so delicious. And then, boom, the conviction or the uh, the strength and the power of the the message like really really hits home. Um, and I really appreciate that uh, about his teaching uh, and his style. Uh, another element which I, I believe is um, is great uh, in terms of a reminder of the, um, the, the, the standard to which teachers are, 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 are to be kept. Um, I would imagine that there's a lot of people that um, want to be teachers and want to be in a position of authority. Um, but the way in which uh, Isaac holds his... Um, Parshas and his sermons reminds me of what is actually uh, a requirement in terms of being a scholar and somebody who knows the word. So, for example, it seems to be quite a, an open forum in terms of how people can contribute to uh, the teaching, uh, which may not sound like any great shakes, but when you're in the midst of a presentation or if you're trying to deliver something and you have variables coming at you it can become difficult to 
to manage. And I would imagine there's many preachers that once they're in the pulpit, they're not. It's not a Q and A session. You know, it's it's a message. Um, but what I appreciate about Isaac is he he seems to uh, really blend his ability to deliver the message, to stay on point, but yet facilitate any contributions that are made by um, the congregation. Also with an ability to link scripture to scripture. So somebody will say, I think it's in this one that this is said, and he'll repost with, yes, of course, because in Matthew this, and you're like, wow, like this guy knows, like he's he's been, he's he, he knows the word, and he knows the relationship between the scriptures. And um, again, it's the way in which it's delivered, which I, I, I thoroughly appreciate and is a reminder for me and for anyone else watching that, well, if you are going to be um, leading and teaching and presenting uh, the word of God, you know, study yourselves approved, basically, because it seems to be, again, with his congregants as well, like these guys know their stuff, like they are the assembly of the called out believers. So a lot of these guys have been in church, I would imagine, for a long time. And have come to the revelation of the Torah and everything else that, that goes with it. That the the questions and the positions of even the congregants are going to be to a certain degree and standard because they're that called out, they're that committed to the truth. Um, that they're going to be like Bereans. So if if your congregants are like Bereans, then you know the standard for the teacher is is, is going to be exponentially higher. So um, let's have a look at another clip here. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Even within the first word, if you broke down this first word, there's so many words hidden within even this very first Hebrew word. Like bar, for instance. What does the word bar mean? Sun. So we see the sun and the olive tov here in this very first verse. So the very first focus is the word of God and something's going to happen with the Word of God. If we look at this after bar, Aleph, it represents God. So you have the Son of God first depicted in the first three letters. The Son of God is also known as the Creator. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But it goes further. If you look at the sheen, the last three letters, sheen, yod, tav, this is the word for thorns. And then within the word, you see we have rosh. What's rosh? Like we have rosh kodesh, we have head, exactly. So you see a picture starting to be formulated, and then if you look at uh, brosh, the word for tree is brosh. It's spelled with the bait and the resh and the sheen by itself without the olive. So even hidden within the first word, we see hidden glimpses of the plan of salvation. The son of God with thorns on his head hanging on a tree. And we haven't even looked at all of the words that pop out of Bereshit. Again, real short clip, but um, it brings to mind, like, if again, if you've been on this walk um, for a period of time, you're familiar, you'd be familiar with this style of teaching, the, uh, the beauty of the, the Hebraic language itself, the breakdown of the structure, what it means and represents. And um, I think there can be times where we take for granted if we've been doing this for a little, for a period of time, or at least been under the uh, the tuition of it um how amazing this is and and bear in mind while i present this like I, i'm not anyone to be crit critiquing or saying who's this that or the other like it's, it's it's who am i like genuinely who am i i can say that i'm a i'm a student i'm a disciple of of yeshua and i greatly appreciate um good teaching and, and sound doctrine. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate the celebration of what it is that actually takes place with a lot of these um, ministries is, is incredible because when you, 
you know, there are those who are maybe perhaps in uh, Christian denominations uh, who would advocate for studying the Hebrew, for, for studying the Greek. And um, to be perfectly honest, I think that can be um, from a almost like a vocational standpoint of like, well, I need to study these things in order to be a pastor, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something about the messianic arm when it comes to the reading and the appreciation of the Hebrew that um, is just absolutely stunning and opens up the faith in a way that's tangible and God-breathed that we couldn't appreciate when we tried to open a Gideon's Bible whenever we stayed in a hotel, you know. Unfortunately, there can be... um, uh, uh, there can be problems with those that will study a bit of Hebrew and then pretend that they you're like well aware of the pitfalls and the trappings within the messianic movement. Let's let's not uh, get that uh, twisted. Like we're we're aware of what takes place. However, to celebrate uh, this and to take stock and go, do you know what? I can't take this for granted because I remember when I first come on this path uh, and seeing the Hebrew and going, wow. This is incredible. Also, with uh, what I uh, enjoy about Isaac and um, and what he does is he dips into certain parts of um, uh, certain parts of the word in a way that isn't like overkill. Like he will go into the gematria of uh, and the numerical values within the language. Um, to illustrate a point or to highlight repetition or to to show the majesty and the sheer uh, wonder and genius of the word. But he's not doing it in a a kind of Kabbalistic sense of, well, if you do this and then this prophecy, it's like, it's very, um, I won't say elementary, but I can watch it and go, right, yeah, it's, this I, I get it. It's not some mad conspiracy video about the gematria. This means that Donald Trump is the anti. Like it's not that, which I really appreciate as well. Um, personally, um, I think over the last couple of years, aside from the the studies that I'm under here at the Alman House, uh, the the real life uh, congregation that I'm a part of and serve with, um, the, this would be my personal go to in terms of parshas. So if there's a pastor on that week. Uh, chances are I'll, I'll watch um, Isaac uh, during the week just to get some uh, insight. Uh, also, um, quite often what I appreciate with uh, the teachings on their YouTube is that there's the original, I believe, recordings of the pastors, and then if there's a repetition, there's like an in-depth, almost shorter pastor study as well, which will give a different reflection. It's normally recorded as an audio um, but again, uh, a lot of fruit to be had there. Um, but yeah, that's assembly called up believers. Again, there are things within Isaac's doctrine or understanding that I may not completely agree with, but there's no way I'm going to miss out on the a- absolute plethora of fruit to be had from the teaching and, and what he's, uh, the work that him and his congregation have done. So again, I just want to, Big up assembly of called out believers. Thank them for the work that they do and uh, for continuing to shine a light in their part of the world. Okay, so let's go. The next one. Now, I have to confess, this is a ministry in which I've watched barely nothing of, but I've heard so much about and... I feel convicted to have not <laughs> not watched more because I could uh, speak to other people in the fellowship, like Sonia will attest and Beverly and oh, Rebecca. All of the guys will say Jacob's tent, Bill Cloud, and I'm like Bill Cloud. Bill, I keep hearing Bill Cloud, Bill Cloud. Um, my brother Jackie, he recently got back from the uh, the states uh, from a visit. Uh, paid a visit to Jacob's tent, had nothing but good good uh, things to say. Uh, at the top of the show, I said there are, this isn't necessarily about a, an official endorsement as such from the Almond House, but I, I could probably do that with these guys, even though I haven't watched anything of them, just purely because of the amount of uh, 
quotables I've had from other people about how oh, I, I saw this on Bill Cloud and it's exactly what was being preached here and there was like a correlation between the two. Um, so, uh, yeah, not I've heard nothing but good things, uh, but I need to uh, pull my finger out and uh, get involved. Um, so I'll just get a little snippet. Um, let's have a look. Uh, every season has a reason. In the words of Solomon, everything and everyone has a purpose. And every purpose has a season. Every season has a reason. Some of them are to build up. Some of them are to tear down. Some of them are to plant. Some of them are to pluck up. And whatever the season is, it's for that purpose to be served. But when it's time to be scattering stones, you don't gather. But when it's time to gather, you don't scatter. So how important is it for our season to get lined up with what season he's in? It's pretty important that the season that we're in or that we think we're in lines up with what he's actually doing. Amen? Because we don't want to be working against him, do we? That's a losing proposition. We need to know his heart. We need to know his mind. And he said he would raise up a faithful priest who would do that. I rate that. And I also respect a man that wears a shirt with his sleeves rolled up because he's active. He's about his business. Um, joking aside, um, I've heard amazing things about Bill Cloud and his work. Uh, as I said, I've not taken any time to watch. So please hit us up in the comments. Let me know why I should check him out and what you like about Bill Cloud and everything that's going on at Jacob's Tent. I know it's a big movement. I know there's a lot of things going on out there. Um, but yeah, get involved and, and tell me why I need to uh, get hip to it. Right. Uh, next up. Rise on Fire Ministries with PD. Now, again, much like um, uh, Bill Cloud, um, this is a ministry and a person uh, in which I could wholeheartedly say the Almond House has like a double thumbs up for, um, not only in terms of the correlate, correlatory um, teachings and timings of things that have been preached on or taught, um, but actually, uh, Joe and Jackie have, have, have done appearances and interviews with PD, and um, I know they have a, a, a good relationship. And um, I, uh, again, just to reiterate, there can be some funny areas in and around the tour observant movement without naming names. But every now and again, you come across somebody that gets it, and... PD and his wife get it. We're told to walk this out in spirit and truth. And I believe um, from what uh, PD puts out there and what he holds to be uh, dear to him, he understands the relationship between spirit and truth. Uh, to walk in the fullness of the Torah and all of its blessings, but also to be walking uh, with the gifts and the gifts of the spirit. And um, I think that's, if you were to look holistically at the body of Christ, and I'm sure there are many that would agree, maybe some that would disagree, that there can be uh, a merging of these two sides of the revelation of the Torah and then walking in the fullness of the, the gifts of the spirit and for this to come together in a way that's like absolutely powerful, prophetic and the way that Yah intended the word to be uh, to be walked in and to be unified in is to be walking in the power of the kingdom and the strength of Yeshua in, with an abundance of the fruits of the spirit and to be doing it in the gifts of the spirit so with that being said um, part of the thing that I really appreciate about uh, PD uh, and the work that he does is that I really think he's like um, he's like a team player in that he's strong in a lot of areas. Uh, he's like a, a, a Steven Gerrard. Of, of <laughs> apologies for the for the football reference, but he can do every he can do all things within a team. So I've I've seen him preach, I've seen him teach, I've seen him uh, deliver messages. 
that are powerful. I've seen him deliver messages that are gentle. Uh, even within his channel itself, um, you've got a great blend of um, prophetic messaging. You've got interviews. Uh, you've got uh, apologetics in a Torah, uh, I guess, construct, which is um, amazing because, again, I really enjoy apologetics. I really enjoy the element of what it means to express and uh, celebrate the faith, particularly to those who don't uh, know things about it. But he's doing it in a context that's related to the Torah, which can be amazing. Uh, again, it can be crossing uh, many boundaries and bridges within uh, the body itself. And um, just in terms of like his content is like, he puts in a lot of work and across the board, you've got such a blend of, of um, yeah, a real blend of, 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 of stuff like demonology, deliverance, uh, spiritual gift abuses, he also is very good at, uh, again, um, uh, kind of up-to-date news style. You know, things take place in the news or in the media, and he's on it, and he's he's giving great explanations and apologetics in terms of how we're to approach it uh, within, the, within the lens of Messianic believers. Um, so from a, from a content and a consistency point of view, like really, really um, great. Uh, one video was gonna play, but I saw something else. How were how were people saved before Jesus came? Uh, just really good, like stuff that you would contemplate if you've been in the Word and been in on this path for a while. And uh, he doesn't shy away from it. Now, the clip I'm gonna play today again. I'm tired of saying it myself. There's so many clips that I could play. There's a lot to. Um, the, the 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 things that he's put out but i i thought this clip um really represents his heart and now forgive me if i'm wrong and again this isn't about putting people on a pedestal or it's just i think it's good to celebrate people it's good to take stock and go i'm glad he's on my side but i think what this clip it really iterates is his heart for the for the bride of christ and uh this message that i watched uh, actually today was actually particularly pertinent for me personally at this moment um so it struck me in the feels but i think um what you will find that comes across with pd is his heart and his desire to see the best for the for the bride and that all of the things that he and his wife endeavor to do is ultimately for our edification and for our benefit and is normally delivered in in such a tender gentle way um but also um vulnerable but obviously when we are weak he's made strong so there's always a theme of um, conviction and strength within his messages i'm generalizing but that's the overall i feel uh, feel that i i get so this clip uh, i'm just going to let it play out it's powerful shalom brown sisters we live in a culture and in a world that's full of desires full of passions I want to read to you something that Paul said. It's just been on my heart recently. He says in Philippians 4 verse 11, Now that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And this is the secret. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know what Paul is saying is, look, I have had times where I was poor. I had little. I had struggles. And there were times that I abounded. I had plenty. I was blessed. But yet I have learned that there is one thing that all of it has in common with one another, that no matter where I am in my life and what I am facing and how much I have, it remains God who strengthens me. You know, it's comes becomes so easy, especially when we feel blessed and things are going well to feel like we are what strengthens us. That we are what carries us. And then and when something goes wrong, we make a mistake because that's usually how things go wrong with us. 
we sin, we fall because we take our eye off him. And then we have to learn it all over again, what it means to be content, even when everything is taken away from us. You know, when we look at the Psalms, I want to read to you as well, a famous chapter that many of you know. And uh, we read in Psalm 23, a Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And David is speaking about how when he has the Lord, listen to this. People don't get this. This is what he actually is saying is, is when he has the Lord, there is nothing more to want. When he has Yeshua, there's nothing more to want. Even, you know, when we when we are brought as low as low and we are stripped to the bone, there is nothing that we have on us, no cloak to cover our nakedness, no coin to buy some bread. When we are at our most desperate place of despair, I shall not want because he is all sufficient for me, whether I am brought low or taken up high, I shall not want because here's the reality. And, and I don't know if you can connect with this, but I certainly can is, is I don't deserve anything that is good. Like, how can I want? How can I desire? When I know how broken I would be without him. When I know that it is only because of what he has done. When it is only because of his sacrifice for me. That I could even be anything or say anything that is good. Brothers and sisters. We sometimes think of ourselves as as being so self-sufficient of righteousness and of ourselves that we are the ones who make ourselves so good and we deserve everything that this world has to offer. We deserve wealth. We deserve, you know what, what I deserve. You take my smallest sin, my widest lie, or whatever I have done in my life, take the smallest one you can find, the one that everyone would probably look at and say, oh, that's nothing. And for that sin, I deserve to be separated. I deserve to be separated from him forever because of that sin. And you may wonder, <laughs> why am I crying? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm crying because of his love for me, for you. I'm crying because Yeshua's death, burial and resurrection has made a way for me to be with him. And if you don't cry about that, you just haven't got it yet. You just haven't. It's just you. It hasn't gotten into your heart yet. See, when you really understand the love of God, 
it grips you. And and especially when you've made a mistake in your life, that you can look back on, and, and I'm talking big or small, it doesn't matter. And you look at that mistake and, and you look at God and it's like, God, you are so holy. And this mistake is so unholy. This sin that I have, right, that you have, that we all have been covered in because of our choices. We look at that and look at God and all I can see is incompatibility. And with all that in mind, and I I see what he's done for me to reunite to me with the father that I can one day stand with him face to face because I have simply trusted and I have taken a hold of what Yeshua has done for me. I shall not want anything else. I don't even want to ask for anything else. Because he didn't even need to do that. And I wouldn't even be qualified to ask for anything else. But he did it for me and for you. He cleansed us. And he allowed us in his presence. I shall not want. And when you experience this revelation and you understand that he has given you this, it brings you to a place where even if you have challenges and trials and tribulations and persecutions and all the things that the Bible promises will happen to us. You know how the disciples were able to live through those things. It's because they were so satisfied in Yeshua and what he has done for them that anything else they could face because they were empowered by what he has done for them and they did not feel that they had a right to anything except for what God has put in their life. And so this recognition of our state is a means of gaining freedom from ourselves and our fears because we get completely satisfied in his will for us. You know, we fear that we will lose something. We will fe- we fear that we will not be accepted, but rejected instead. We we fear that um, people will think of us this and that way or. But when you understand that he is enough. Then n- none of those things matter except that he is enough. Then you get deliverance from those fears. I shall not want. What do you want? It's my question. Um, I think, uh, again, who am I to say anything about anybody else other than to appreciate um, the revealing of of, of of the man's heart within the way he which he, the way he reaches his audience is um, is is beautiful. No need to do a deep analysis of the complexities of the message uh, to come up with some long-winded thesis. It's just the heart of the bride of Christ. Um, I love the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel. And I think there can be times where we can maybe fall away from that simplicity. But one thing I also appreciate about PD is the the fullness the the fullness of the gospel in terms of its covenantal implications its relationships to the Torah uh, the beauty of the feasts and the Sabbath um, the beauty of the fullness of the faith in its Hebraic context um, steering away from legalism and religious uh, sentiments but understanding what it means to be a disciple of Christ to walk this narrow path to fall, to stumble, to, to, God willing, get back up again and to carry on uh, walking this walk. I, uh, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank PD and his wife and everybody involved with his ministry that contributes uh, so lovingly to uh, the body. I know I could speak on behalf of a lot of the congregants at the Almond House. We've enjoyed um, 
the uh, the offerings from this ministry for a, for a, for a while now, and you are willing, we will continue to do so. So um, that's Rise on Fire Ministries. I'd be surprised if you're not familiar. Uh, if you aren't, get over there, check them out. Um, but from uh, from our house to yours, thank you. We appreciate you. Um, next up, a personal favorite of mine. Um, I have great sentimental attachment um, with these guys and to this day continue to enjoy uh, the ministry and in particular the YouTube channel of Now You See TV. Uh, now for any of you that would care to listen, um, these guys uh, for me were really instrumental in uh, the time in which I came to the faith uh, how many years? Uh, six, seven years ago, and it was the content that I came across initially um, that contributed in my um, professing professing as uh, of Jesus as Yeshua as 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 Christ and and finding a faith in God. And uh, I don't say that lightly either. Obviously, it was the Spirit, but but which led me to that to that moment. Um, and that timing of salvation. But these were the first guys that I came across um, in and around that time um, that really uh, spoke to me. Um, now, at that time, I was um, very much enamored and deep into some uh, occult, uh, esoteric practices, shall we say. Uh, praise God for deliverance in that area. However, it was the, I guess you could say, the fringe uh, nature of this channel, even back then, that enabled the likes of myself and many others um, to come to this uh, beautiful uh, realization of um, what it means to be uh, born again. And... Um, Again, this isn't to elevate or to um, uh, this isn't e to elevate men in particular, but I, I'm incredibly grateful for um, the work that these guys do, and I don't hold them in a position of perfection. I'm not looking for them to be, um, you know, a a uh, a certain caliber of person because we're all human we all fall short of the glory of god we are of course called to be a, 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 a royal priesthood we have precepts we have standards of which we are striving by the spirit of god to uh to walk with and walk in undoubtedly but there's a realness to uh john pounders and david carrico in particular which as all i've always connected with um, particularly in my early days uh, now, with regards to their content, it, I mean, these guys have been doing it for a long time um, and they cover such a vast amount of uh, topics and subject. And to call them uh, somebody on the fringe would be uh, dismissive and would not do justice to the understanding that they have and what they preach on with regards to the fullness of the Torah uh, the the Sabbath, the feast, and all of the things that we all have in common, um, which are the foundations to our commonality within this uh, area of of the body. I think why I say it'd be dismissive to say that they're a fringe um, outfit is because of a the depth and the breadth of the subjects that they cover on this channel. But I know that. Um, particularly with David Carrico, he's been doing this for a long, long time. Um, he has his own channel, the the FOJC, where he's been doing straight up sermon preaching for a long time. So there can be, um, I think there could potentially be a, an area of um, just saying, well, these guys are just, all they do is talk about giants and serpent seed. And it's like, no, no, there's, there's, there's a body, there's a there's a historical body of work that these guys have put in. Um, 
Another element that I really enjoy about Now You See TV as a ministry, not just a channel, is that, uh, again, when I came to the, the faith, there was a, a, a network of believers both in the, the US and, and the UK at the, at the time were kind of the common denominator was Now You See TV. Like whether it's people appearing on it, whether it's people networking through the channel, um, whether it's people being able to fellowship through um, that networking, or even uh, having uh, met people and then going, oh yeah, now you see TV. Like, chances are, if you're, it, you're going to know about these guys, and I think that's a testament to the uh, consistency and the the work that these guys have, have put in over the. You know, I, I guess nigh on a decade of, of content. Now, I haven't always consistently watched Now You See TV. Like, when I, as I said, when I first came to, I watch all the videos, sit there for hours, da 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 da. And now I probably had like a period of, I don't know, maybe like three years where I didn't watch anything. But I found myself in the last year coming back to their stuff because a lot of the things that I was either researching or getting into. Uh, myself I found that they were already doing uh, stuff on like there's a lot of episodes of after hours I haven't done because they've just already <laughs> I was just like well they've already done it so there's no you know I, I wouldn't want to just be copying or anything but um, with that being said there's a lot of things which I think uh, I really appreciate about uh, the content that they make particularly at the moment you've got Tartaria which is like a big buzzword on the internet um, and I think they've got a great, uh, and even giants, like you can't watch a mainstream uh, YouTube comment, commentator's channel without them like talking about like demons or or giants in, in Miami or whatever. Like a lot of these biblical uh, themes are actually coming through to, um, uh, to a lot of mainstream like YouTube channels. And what I really like about the work that they're doing at the moment, they have a really good way of uh, tying in a lot of these... Um, fringe and uh supernatural um uh topics and actually linking it into biblical prophecy and again it's not to say well that's the 10 horns there so that's that like <laughs> that's cool and that but there's a real soundness to the way in which they present um uh, certain revelations um that are taking place in the world today, but without making everything about prophecy, which is really cool. One thing, another thing that I appreciate, and again, some of these teachers, some of these people are going to use references to the Apocrypha, are going to be uh, quoting Enoch, and I know that's not to everybody's taste, and uh, for me personally, I'm not here to try and endorse anything as canon that isn't generally regarded as canonical, and that's not what I'm, 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 I, I need to do. However... I like the I like looking at the apocryphal text. I like looking at historic uh, documents. I like to know what Josephus said about this, that, and the other, and how all of these things can correlate to build um, a picture that is always supported by a foundation of the word. And again, I know that these guys did a series on the Book of Enoch, however, which is which is great. Um, however, you'll uh, nine times out of ten you'll find with their um, with their stuff, it's always grounded in scripture. And if it isn't complementing or, or at least lining up with it, it they, they don't use it. So that's what I've been really enjoying about their stuff recently, aside from the sentimental attachment I have, <laughs> is is uh, just over the last year, like some really, really captivating things. And uh, again, because I probably watched too much short format stuff online and I've scrambled my brain uh, and uh, like it's harder for me to sit there for longer periods of time and be engaged with uh, a lot of things. That's just the that's just me being honest. I I need to shape up in that area. But uh, with that being said, I, I I can sit and watch and sit and watch these guys for a couple hours quite comfortably. Um, so if you're not familiar with these guys, it's just a little snippet. Um, in the slide in Daniel here, chapter two. 42 and 43. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest 
iron mixed with miry clay. That's Prometheus's brother marrying the little clay woman that Jupiter made. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Thing about Carico, which I just love, is that um, like he's incredibly learned and understanding of um, a lot of theistic structures, Freemasonry, esoteric, all of that stuff, um, which I think is great to have in the armory because I, I believe that as a as a man and a, as a teacher, he's got a balance of what he propagates in terms of his understanding of the word. So he's not just all like this is the devil and this is what he does like all the time. Like there's a there's a real strong balance, but I I, I can't help but I can't help but be impressed by his ability to to reference texts or doctrines uh, that the enemy has and then is then able to refute or correlate them to scripture like if you can find somebody else that's on that like by all means and I know there's a couple out there but I, I, th I think he's I think he's great but they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with miry clay and it appears that when uh, Nephilim, uh, they can mate with humans easier than one another. They're almost like mules in that respect, I think. But the, the symbolism here is obvious. You know, what does the clay represent? It represents mankind, and it represents the people of God. And this is Satan's agenda all along to corrupt the human genome through the whole Genesis 6 scenario to, you know, in Jeremiah 8 and 6, O house of Israel, cannot I, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. So it's just in your face here, the story of Prometheus. It's the entire Genesis 6 scenario, and it's the story of Lucifer. Yeah, just, uh, it's a really good, uh, in this example, he's talking about the story of Prometheus, um, and, and it's, um, mythology um, he, he has a great way of um, taking uh, certain mythologies or or uh, examples of like cultural or even literary characters historical characters that are, are kind of known within the public domain whether it be in literature or uh, even cinema uh, and just in general belief and he's then able to like cross-reference that with the actual biblical uh, origin of that story or that precept, which again, like uh, if you if you're like me and you've grown up in a culture of all of these um, protagonists, whether it's in Greek mythology, whether it's superheroes, all of these things that we've been so inundated with, um, it's one thing to say you need to unlearn all of this, but unlearn it to what standard and to what representation. And I think what I've really enjoyed about David Carrico over the years and John Pounders is their ability to transpose these narratives and stories and, I guess, archetypes to a degree and then actually, yeah, transpose it with biblical truth and prophecy. And you're like, oh, right, so that's what that represents and that's what that's a derivative of. It's like, it's, it's class. It's, it's so good. And as we look at this, I, I have more and more of uh, indication that that old kingdom of Lucifer and the kingdom of Tartaria is the very same thing. Now, let's think about Vulcan for just a little bit. Now, this is the old guy Vulcan here, the god of fire and of smelting iron. And I always think when I see this, when you look at the Capitol Dome and you look up, George Washington is floating up there with old Vulcan. You know, mm -hmm. he's one of the people riding the sky there in the Capitol Dome of this good Christian nation. Yeah. Now, Vulcan, in, uh, there's a book here, and he was the one in the Prometheus story that made the woman of clay for Prometheus's brother to mate with. And in this book here, John Yarker, the Arcane Schools, Yarker, he was a fine fella. He was a friend of Aleister Crowley, so you knew he was an upright fella. And here in the Arcane Schools, he says this. And boy, he's even got him a little backward swastika on that. So you know he's got to be a fine fellow. But he goes on, he says here in this book, 
He says, all the authorities are agreed that the mysteries practiced under this name were allied with the Cyclopean mysteries. And he says, equally, Tubal Cain and Chrysor is the Vulcan of Greek mythology. Now, this is basically Luciferian Freemasonic theology, and they equate the god Vulcan with Tubal Cain of the Bible. And there, as we see, he goes on to say, uh, he said he also supposes that the confession of Lamech may hint at the beginning of human sacrifice. I just get sucked in. I could easily just carry on watching that. Um, yeah, I, again, it, it's it's the um, what I really enjoy is the dynamic between David and and John. Um, I I think if any of us on this walk had somebody like David, um, dare I say, mentoring us or in and around us, it would be uh, really fruitful and very helpful to to have. And I love the way in which these two um, uh, work together. And, um, you know, I've spoken a lot about David, but John, he's, you can see the development and the growth over the years in terms of his understanding and his, um, his commitment to, um, you know, getting into subjects and topics and presenting it in a way that's, like, really digestible and... Um, sometimes actually just good fun like a lot of these things can be um quite dark quite sinister um and sometimes we do need that balance to be able to approach these subjects in a way that isn't overwhelming or uh, even overstimulating in that sense but um yeah and just uh i just appreciate these guys a lot i have begun to understand personally the time and effort that it takes to either um, do a presentation or or to do something online, uh, aside from the, um, I guess, almost the vulnerability of putting yourself in the public domain, um, it's, no, uh, it's no small feat. So I just want to, again, a personal thank you and um, an appreciation to the work that these guys have done have continued to do and hopefully uh yeah willing in the future we'll, we'll do we'll do more of there's probably loads of stuff that i've forgotten about what i wanted to talk about with these guys but again you you're probably already familiar with them and um hopefully you you already enjoy their content so with that being said that was my small, short-ish look at uh, Messianic Ministries Online. Um, I would like, I guess, my closing thought is that as much as I enjoy uh, online teachings, the accessibility to different uh, parts of the body, uh, all of the work and people that have contributed uh, to me personally and to those that I know. It's an incredible thing, and uh, the blessing of being in this uh, technological era is that it's been able to support and develop many people who are either isolated, um, who don't know where to turn because of institutionalized religion and churchianity, is not the place to go when they've really received an encounter by the Holy Spirit and um, people don't know what to do with you because uh, this is a, a different this is a different walk altogether. So I really appreciate all of those uh, and more. There are there are plenty more in which I could have touched on and if there is any more in which I haven't that have blessed you, then by all means uh reach out in the comments and let us know and signpost for, for these places. Um, with that being said, I it's my hope that these uh, online presences are inspiration enough for you to step out in faith and get to congregate in real life. Uh, as I mentioned, there are those that may be incapacitated, may be in a medical position, may just be mad isolated, I don't know. 
what your situation is. But I would encourage and I would um I would I would definitely encourage you to take a step out and if in order to be closer to those who are like minded in uh in your faith. Now, that isn't to say that you need to uh, compromise to a part of detriment within your walk with Yeshua. If there are certain compromises that are just too much for you to make, then I completely appreciate that. But I think part of this series is to highlight that nobody has this. We all see through a glass dimly. Uh, We all only see the truth in part. And I believe it's not until we reach the other side of uh, at least the millennial kingdom where we begin to understand that when... Yeshua, the master himself, teaches us and shows us and reveals the mysteries to us himself. We're all going to be seeing in part. So my my final thought is try not to hold these teachers and these ministries to an insurpassable degree of of, uh, scrutiny because it's just not possible. We are but men. We are all frail, fragile and fallible. but with that being said, use these ministries, use, use these teachings to step out and, and to join a congregation, to, to move, to, to, to change your life, to, you know, how pleasant it is to, to dwell uh, with the gra- gathering of the, of the brethren, you know. And I can personally attest that my life has changed greatly through doing just that. I came across these guys online and was watching and learning And it came to a time where I thought, no, I need to step out. I need to be with the brethren. I need to know what it is to serve the body of Christ because we can get puffed up. We can become full of knowledge. But any scholar will tell you that the Torah is not about filling your head with knowledge. It's about having the spirit of knowledge indwelling you so that you can then go out and serve and to walk the Torah out. This isn't about passing a final exam. This is a practical and a written (laughs) assessment we're under. So with that being said, I hope that the spirit can connect you with like-minded believers. I hope that the the people that have inspired you on your walk online uh, can then transfer to an impact in your in your real life, because that's where that's where the fruit is. So with that being said, um, I thank you for the time that you've taken to to spend with me. Um, If you haven't already, like, subscribe, do the algorithm stuff. Um, God willing we will see you on the next uh, next show and uh, I hope that this uh, blesses you I hope it reaches you and your family well uh, in the meantime uh, take care God bless uh, from our house to yours uh, Shalom